Hey everybody, this is Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm reading the Bible through in a year. Today is day 168 of our one-year Bible reading plan. I'm so glad that you're with me today, getting a little bit of the Old Testament, a little bit of the New Testament, a little bit of the Psalms, and a little bit of the Proverbs every single day for an entire year. I believe fundamentally that the Word of God goes forth. It does not return empty and accomplishes what God sent it to do. That's Isaiah 55, 11. God watches over his word to see it performed. That's Jeremiah 1, 12. In the entire volume of the book, it is written of Jesus Christ. That's Psalm 40, verse 8. In Hebrews 10, verse 7, we can trust God's word. It will do what God sends it to do. So that's why I'm reading the Bible through in a year for myself. I'm recording it and putting it online for other believers as well, because I believe in the power of God's word through the living, active, sharp Holy Spirit quickened to us, able to discern the thoughts and intents of our heart and so much more. That's Hebrews 4.12. Anyway, make sure you hit thumbs up underneath this video. Each time you read with me or you're listening to this, um, some people read along in their Bibles. Other people just listen as they're going about their day. I had somebody recently tell me they were listening as they were on a road trip. And um, that's awesome. All great ways to get God's word into your heart. Faith comes by hearing the words of God. That's Romans 10, 17. So I'm happy to read to you, but make sure you tap like it. Not only keeps you accountable to each day's journey, that's important, creating mental habits and psychologically holding yourself that you reminding yourself to come back checking it off your list but also it helps you and i partner together in this ministry as co-laborers in christ that's a big deal people on youtube ministries like this they don't just get here by themselves it's other believers viewers that are helping build that ministry and you have a stake in that i think that's a pretty powerful thing that God saw a long way off that we would still be the body of Christ. Even though you and I might never meet till we're on the other side of the veil, we can still co-labor together in Christ. All that to say, tap like underneath this video. And if you haven't already subscribed to The Way of the Worshipper, subscribe to The Way of the Worshipper. It's another great way it pushes the, it advances the gospel online. Okay. Let's get into the reading of God's word. We're going to open with a word of prayer for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. We just declare right now in the name of Jesus that God is the great king above all gods, the king enthroned above the flood, that there's no one like you, no one beside you. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Father, we appeal to you as the God of heaven. Father, we cry out to you today. Come, Lord, and have your way in us right now. We give you our hearts in this moment. Come, Lord, speak to us throughout your word. Show us what we can't see. Reveal to us what you need us to see. Father, even in our desperate condition and in our brokenness, Father, in the ways that we continually fall short, our hearts are to honor you. Father, help us. We invite you here. You're welcome here, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, remember to check out the links below sometimes on the way of the worshiper.com. I've already done some journalism style devotional blog articles, deeper dives into God's word that I've done on my own as a writer and a journalist, but also there's resources there for continued Bible study. Those are linked below. Anything that comes up, I just throw it down below if it relates to expanding God's kingdom, increasing in knowledge and wisdom and faith in the Lord. Okay, so today we're continuing on in 1 Kings chapter 15 verses 25 through the end of first Kings 17. When we last left off, we ended the Jeroboam, Rehoboam saga. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. Jeroboam was the son of a servant. And the kingdom is now divided. We've got civil, essentially a civil war, another time between these tribes. God didn't want that. When he parceled up land and gave everybody a lot, one of the reasons why he did that was so that there wouldn't be wars between everybody. That's why they had such clear boundaries and they were allowed to appeal and to ask for certain regions that they wanted because God wanted to usher in eras of peace. But now because of Solomon's sin, where he cast off the Lord and built, built, oh, it's horrible. He built temples and Ashtoreth poles to Shamash and Molech and these disgusting, abhorrent gods. So God has now told him because of David, I'll keep a remnant for you. And that's Judah. But the rest is going over to the son of a servant that was Jeroboam. And he did not at all understand any of God's laws. He didn't even care. 
So now Israel has become spiritually prostituted through Jeroboam and Rehoboam. So he's now died. And now we've got separate kings that are rising up from these lines. And we're, this is what Kings is all about. We're about to trace lots of trajectories of lots of kings from kingdom number one, which is the kingdom of Judah through the line of David. So keep that in mind, Judah. Remember, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So the, the portion that is Judah and a little bit of Benjamin and the rest of them are all the way over as the nation of Israel. So that's where we are as we're picking it up in first Kings 25. We're talking about Nadab, king of Israel. Those are the ones that split from when Jeroboam was their leader. Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned over Israel two years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin, with which he made Israel to sin. Basha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Basha killed him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, for Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. It was in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, that Basha killed him and took his throne. When he became king, Basha killed all the house of Jeroboam. No one from Jeroboam's family was left breathing. He completely destroyed them according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Ahijah, the Shilonite. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and which he made Israel sin by his provocation with which he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. Now, the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Basha, the son of Ahijah, began to reign over all Israel in Terza, and he did so 24 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, with which he made Israel to sin. God takes it very seriously when people who are in positions of leadership cause other people to sin and stumble. To whom much is given, much is required, Jesus said. And so God is, these people are wiping each other out. This has nothing to do with God. God's not in any of this. He did send word on ahead prophetically through different men of God, and he let them know, this is what's coming for you. But they didn't care. And so they were just so caught up in their own power and they were so caught up in their own prestige and they wanted this, this, this game of thrones that they're all playing between Israel and Judah and constant war and battle. None of this was in God's plan. This has nothing to do with God. This has everything to do with people in their sin, willful sin and disobedience. So now here we are in first Kings chapter 16. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani against Basha saying, I exalted you out of the dust and made you prince over my people. And you've walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. See, I will take away the posterity of Basha and the posterity of his house. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Those from the house of Basha who die in the city will be eaten by dogs. And those who die in the fields will be eaten by the birds of the air. Now, the rest of the acts of Basha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Basha slept with his fathers and was buried in Terzah, and Elah, his son, reigned in his place. And so it was by the hand of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, that the word of the Lord came against Basha and his house for all the evil he did in the sight of the Lord in provoking him to anger with the work of his hands, because he acted like the house of Jeroboam and also because he killed it. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, the son of Basha, began to reign over Israel in Terzah, and he did so two years. His servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him. And when he was in Terzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, manager of his house in Terzah, Zimri went in and smote him and killed him. This took place in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, and Zimri reigned over his place. When he began to reign, as soon as he was seated on the throne, 
He executed all the house of Basha. He left no males, neither of his relatives nor of his friends. Thus, Zimri destroyed all the house of Basha, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Basha by Jehu the prophet, because of all the sins of Basha and the sons of Elah his son, by which they sinned and by which they made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days in Terza. Now the troops were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. The troops who were encamped heard how Zimri had conspired and had slain the king. As a result, all Israel made Amri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. Amri went up from Gibbethon and all Israel with him, and they besieged Terzah. When Zimri saw that the city had fallen, he went into the citadel of the king's house, and he burned the king's house over him with fire, and he died. Because of his sins, which he had sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in walking in the ways of Jeroboam, and in his sin, which he did to make Israel sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his treason, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ganath, to make him king, and half followed Amri. But the people who followed Amri defeated the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ganath. So Tibni died, and Amri reigned. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Amri began to reign over Israel, and he did so 12 years. He reigned six years in Terzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. He fortified the hill and named the city he built after the name of Shemer, owner of the hill, calling it Samaria. Uh-oh, that's going to come back in later. But Amri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all those who preceded him. For he walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin, which he made Israel to sin to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Amri performed and his might that he showed, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Amri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria and Ahab, his son, reigned in his place. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Amri, began to reign over Israel. Ahab, the son of Amri, did more evil in the sight of the Lord than all who were before him. The sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, were seen as minor for him to walk in. For he took Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, the king of the Sidonians, as his wife, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He raised an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Ahab made an Asherah and did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who preceded him. In his days, Hiel, the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid the foundation at the expense of his firstborn, Abaram, and set the gates at the cost of his, the life of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. The fall of Jericho occurred in Joshua 6. That's when the walls came down and the people shouted and everybody gave that mighty shout and they marched around the city. So Joshua, at the very end, they burned everything in it with fire, only the silver, the gold, the bronze and iron they gave into the treasury of the house of the Lord. This is what happened when they entered in Canaan and took out Jericho. They let Rahab live. That also happened. Messengers spying on Jericho. And at that time, here we go. At that time, Joshua made the people swear. Cursed before the Lord will be the man who arises and rebuilds this city of Jericho. He will establish it at the cost of his firstborn and erect its gates at the cost of his youngest child. So the Lord was with Joshua and became famous throughout all the land. That's what happened. So now here we are at the end of 1 Kings 16. And this man, Hiel the Bethelite, built Jericho. 
It was laid at the foundation of his firstborn, Abiram, and the cost of the life of his youngest son, Sagub, according to the word of the Lord. What an interesting through line that is from Joshua all the way hundreds, like 400 years later. Here we are now in the books of the Kings. God's word always stands. And in the Bible, when people speak curses that are righteous curses, meaning they are inspired of the Lord because of the destruction of sin, they they said, because the curse of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. When Jesus Christ became a curse for us and took that upon himself, that was a profound thing. It was a profound spiritual shift that an innocent person would do something like that. And so the curse was broken through Jesus Christ. But if you still want it, you can still have it. That's what this is showing here, that the curse was still in effect under the law of sin and death. You don't follow God. You want to revive the curse. That's what he did. He revived the curse of sin and the curse came upon him. That's a difficult thing, but it's no less true. All right, let's finish up with 1 Kings 17. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was one of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. There will not be dew or rain these years, except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him saying, go from here and turn eastward and hide by the Kareth brook, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the Kareth brook, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. After some time, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of God came to him saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he got up and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Please get a small cup of water for me to drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord, your God lives, I do not have bread, but only a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil in a jar. I'm gathering two sticks so that I can go in and make it for me and my son so we can eat it and die. Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you've said, but make a little cake for me first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for your son and you. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal will not run out, nor will the jar of oil empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So she went and did what Elijah told her to do. And she and he and her household ate many days. The barrel of meal did not run out, nor did the jar of oil empty according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Later on, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became terribly sick, so much so that he had no breath left in him. She said to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, you you man of God? Have you come to remind me of my sin and to kill my son? And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him out of her arms and carried him up to a loft where he slept and laid him on his own bed. He cried to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, my God. Have you brought tragedy upon the widow with whom I live by killing her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray that you let this child's soul come into him again. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again and he was revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and returned him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. The woman said to Elijah, Now because of this, I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. That's the end of our reading in the Old Testament. Troublesome times, but a very exciting story about Elijah. Do you know who Elijah is a type and shadow of in the New Testament? It's John the Baptist. Elijah was a a meek, straight, the way of the Lord kind of person. And 1 Kings doesn't get into a lot of it, but we'll hear more about it in some of the other books and the accounts. But Elijah, by him saying to Ahab, the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. There will not be dew or rain these years except by my word. And then it's like, oh, go drink from a brook. No, 
there's a lot more written later on that shows this was an incredibly difficult thing he he had to say to Ahab and Ahab did not take it well. So we'll get there on another day. But I do want to say the fact that Ahab, we're, we're seeing this um, escalating sin. I, I just don't even know how far sin can go in the life of somebody who is just bent on sin. There, It knows no bounds because Baal is a type in the shadow of our adversary. He is the geopolitical force that ruled that region through the the Philistines and ruled through the the entire land of Canaan. They kept coming back. They had little smaller gods that they worshipped and they all did evil things. But Baal was the big one. He was the big God. In fact, God warned his people when they were going to enter into Canaan to not fall for the gods, for the Baals. He very specifically noted that it would be the Baals. But here we are. And so God's own nation, Israel, is drifting away from him. While Judah is holding fast, they're drifting away and they're following after. And now he marries Jezebel. That's a very famous story. And we'll get there. Okay, let's go over and read in the New Testament. Reading today, Acts chapter 10, 24 through 48. You know, you would think that that Sidonian woman would have seen and believed that Elijah was a man of God because the she had like a drop of oil and no food left. And she was miraculously sustained the whole time that Elijah was there. You would think that she would start to recognize God. But when her son was raised, that's when she said, now I realize. And she was saying, the Lord, your God. We always notice that what throughout the scriptures that we've read so far since day one, that people say the Lord, your God, but they don't personalize that. They don't say the Lord, my God. But sometimes, like in the case of Jacob, his language does shift after he has an encounter with God and it becomes the Lord, my God. Remember, God's people are a chosen people for sure. But he made ways, even under the old covenant, for people to be grafted into the vine. That's what Jesus was talking about. It's not just just the Gentiles, as we see in the, the New Testament, what they call the Gentiles. It's from all these surrounding nations. They had the option to come in. A lot of them just didn't want to, but she didn't have eyes to see. Her eyes were finally opened when she had this amazing miracle. But I think so many times, I know in my own life, my heart is hardened or my eyes just don't see what God is doing. And I begin to question. And it's finally when your eyes are, are opened, not only do you see, wow, God does an amazing thing, but he's been doing amazing things all along. And one of the purposes, once our eyes are opened going forward is to say, no, I believe in faith that this, this is it strengthens our faith. This is what's going to happen because I look back now and see all the ways that God was working and I will not project that negativity into the future. I will stand in faith. I've seen him do it. I have eyes to see now. I know he's going to do it again. That's how we increase in our faith. When we last left off in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, a Roman centurion who was a devout believer in the Lord, he had some questions and the Lord spoke to Peter and said, you're going to, he lets down the sheet three times and he says, rise and eat. And Peter says, I can't eat that. It's unclean. And the Lord says, what I have called clean, you can't call unclean. And Peter's like, okay. And so now he's approached by these people from Cornelius's household. And they're like, can you come with us? And the Holy Spirit let him know that this was of him. In fact, I loved what he said here. He says, rise and go down. He says to Peter and go with them, doubting nothing. That really inspired me the last time when we were reading it, doubting nothing. So Peter went down to the men who had come from Cornelius's house. Remember, they had been spanked and they had been whipped and all the, they had seen Jesus crucified and beaten. So now the centurion all of a sudden magically wants to talk to them. They probably had a couple red flags up there. They were told they were believers, but God's spirit was there and they had that inner witness that it was going to be okay. And now comes the step of faith where all you have is that internal witness and you have to take a step or not. It's always our choice. And so this is where we last left off. He decides to go with them. With He takes some brothers with them and they end up going into Caesarea to the house of Cornelius. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I myself am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many who had come together. And he said to him, he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jew to visit or approach a foreigner, but God has shown me not to call any man common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without question. Therefore, I ask why you have sent for me. Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until 
this hour, at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and suddenly a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered before God. Therefore send to Joppa for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging at the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So immediately I sent for you, and have you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we're all here, present before God to hear everything the Lord has commanded you. Then Peter began to speak, saying, Truthfully, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. That is an amazing through line. It was just we're talking about the Sidonian women and the way that God had made an ability for people to become part of the people of God. They could have been grafted into the vine by observing the Jewish laws and sacrificing. And God had created all these parameters that actually excluded nobody who wanted to be included. That's the mercy of God. And now here we are all this time later. And Peter is now seeing in every nation, he's now seeing, he's realizing the Old Testament laws that God had said accommodated for this very scenario. And it was a pharisaical culture that had put a mindset into people that they were an exclusionary culture when that was never God's intention. In every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which he sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all, the word which you know that was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day and presented him publicly, not to all the people, but to witnesses previously chosen by God, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach the gospel and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. All the believers of the circumcision who had come with Peter were astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and magnifying God. Then Peter continued, can anyone forbid water for baptizing these who have received the Holy Spirit as we have? So he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. That's the end of the reading in the New Testament for today. What a powerful thing that is to see that peace through Jesus Christ was always the plan. Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins through his name. Yes and amen. Okay, let's go over and finish up with a psalm and a proverb. Reading today, Psalm 134 verses 1 through 3, the last one listed as one of the songs of ascents. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. That's a beautiful psalm. And over and over, the word bless here is one of the Hebrew words for praise, Barak. I write extensively about the seven Hebrew words for praise on the way of the worshiper.com. So that's linked down below to take a look at Barak. Your blessing is in your Barak. And I cover that even more extensively in the book, The Way of the Worshipper. There's also a devotional, a workbook that goes along with it where you can begin to explore the seven Hebrew words for praise. But Barak is such a cool word because in Genesis 22, 17, the Lord tells Abraham in blessing in Barak, I will bless you. I Barak you. And what that means is that we don't worship the Lord for a byproduct or a benefit, but those do exist attached to true worship in spirit and in truth. And so in that ministry to the Lord, that's the exclusive purpose of praise and worship is ministry to the Lord. 
We don't come in seeking God's hand. We seek his face. It's a different dynamic. And God knows the difference. And when we come to minister to him, he is faithful to Barak, to bless in whatever way that is. Too many times we caught up in abundance and miracles and all those things. I'll tell you what, there are things in this world money cannot buy. The peace that passes understanding, the joy unspeakable, full of glory, the love that covers a multitude of sins, the truth spoken in love. You can't buy those things with money. They are the blessings of God, the protection of his presence, surrounding you with favor like a shield. So when we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, ministering to him through the sacrifice of thanksgiving, giving thanks to his name, we lift up our hands in the sanctuary, in the private spaces when nobody's looking. This is when we begin to see a different form of blessing the world cannot define in blessing. I will bless you. That's what God says. So that's Psalm 134. Barak, come bless the Lord, you servants of the Lord. Okay, let's finish up with a proverb. Reading today, Proverbs 17, 9 through 11. I love delving into God's book of human psychology, showing us not only our own motivations and our own hearts, but teaching us to discern the world around us, the way that people behave, the things that motivate people, the things that attract people, the things that repel people, the way we should treat our neighbors, the way that the mind works, the darkness of the world and their mindsets, learning how to navigate in that darkness, the light of God's word. Okay, here we go. Verses nine through 11. He who covers a transgression seeks love, Ooh. but he who repeats a matter separates friends. A reproof enters deeper into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. That's the end of our reading in the book of Psalm, in the book of Proverbs. And that is also the end of our day 168 reading for the day. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button right beneath this video. Check out the resources linked below. I am Alicia Purdy, the publisher of The Way of the Worshiper. I'm so glad you are with me today. There's some really powerful things in God's word today, things to take with us in our devotions and to meditate on. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. I'm so grateful, Father, that there's power in your words that go beyond my own words. I feel so limited, Lord, in my own power. And I never want to fall into some may trust in horses and some may trust in chariots. Father, we as believers right now, we put our trust in the name of our God, through whom is the remission of sins, who gave up his life, who did not consider it his own, but while we were yet in sin. He died for us. Thank you, Lord, for such a powerful thing. Father, help us today to learn better how to speak your words, the words of true power and authority. Father, the words of true wisdom. And your words are the words of life, as Peter said. Thank you, Father, for your great kindness and love toward us. We lift our hands to you in the sacrifice of praise, blessing you, Lord, blessing your name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.